Доброго вечора, ми з України. Hello, my friends, and thank you for joining me for another episode of Ushanka Show, stories about life in the Soviet Union. My name is Sergei Sputnikov, and I was born in the USSR. In today's video, I'll tell you about situation with jeans in the Soviet Union and why jeans were in such a high demand and short supply. By the way, this is a picture of Comrade Sergei and his cool-looking jeans, which I thought was made in Italy. We'll talk about it later. And I wonder if any one of you know what am I doing on this photo. Fun fact, Soviet people discovered jeans back in 1957 during the sixth World Festival of Youth and Students that took place in Moscow. So that's about 85 years after Levi Strauss started making his famous jeans in California. This World Festival of Youth and Students uh, was held in summer of 1957 so that's during the Nikita Khrushchev rule. It attracted around 34,000 young people from 130 countries. That was the largest world festival of youth ever. This amazing festival had two interesting, unexpected side effects. First was sudden increase in births nine months later after the end of the festival. And a lot of children that were born were a mixed race and they got a nickname festival children and the second side effect was jeans rush similar to the american gold rush there was jeans rush in the soviet union that lasted almost 30 years everyone wanted to get a pair of jeans and since market forces that connect demand with supply did not exist in the socialist economy jeans became extremely expensive and extremely desirable and almost like a status symbol in the Soviet Union. I'm talking to the level like having a pair of jeans was similar to be like having a Rolex watch or some very expensive handbag from Prada. To be fair, Soviet industry did produce some interesting clothing items like this stylish pair of Speedos, AKA banana hammock with matching necktie. <laughs> The fact that many Soviet fashion conscious people were ready to sell their soul for the foreign goods were well known. And as you see in this caricature, it's probably from late 70s, there's three people are kissing items that made in USA or made in France. A girl at far left is kissing a dress that says made in USA person in the middle, maybe it's a guy, is kissing jeans with the Lee brand and the lady in the middle on the right, she dropped her money and she's kissing an item that made in Paris. Now the person who was peddling foreign goods had a specific name, Fartsovshik. So if you are living in the Soviet Union, you buy Soviet made goods and resell them, you're a speculant because you do speculation. But people that will get access to foreign goods, maybe from the tourists or from the people that traveled abroad, they are fartsovshiki. It's a really interesting term. Only recently I learned the origins of this strange word. So these kids in Moscow, in Kiev, they were approaching foreigners asking they wanted to buy goods from them, you know, especially jeans. So they'll be saying for sale, for sale. And in Russian, it's almost like sounds like farca, farca, farca. So the person who's dealing with for sale items, farca became farcovshik. So that's the origins of this strange word, which has nothing to do with the Russian language. And here's another caricature on a similar topic. This girl without pants is screaming, or jeans, super rifle, or I announce the hunger strike. And some of you may wonder what the heck is going on here? Why this girl without pants wants a rifle? No, she actually wants jeans that called super rifle. Well, she doesn't want a gun. She wants jeans brand called super rifle, which was, I guess, more premium model from the brand called rifle. Okay, just to make sure you understand, any Soviet teenager would kill to own a pair of American Levi's or even Wrangler or Lee brand jeans, but those were so hard to find in the Soviet Union and because of that they were extremely expensive. People who would smuggle them in 
and resell them through Fartsovshiki, you expect to pay 250, 300 rubles for a pair of jeans. So that's two monthly salaries of average Soviet engineer. Just picture paying $10,000 for a pair of jeans. Of course, you will have some real respect from all your friends. Since Levi's and other American brands were just like diamonds, really hard to find and extremely expensive, we had the whole slew of these sub-brands appeared. One of them was Rifle. Rifle Jeans was an Italian company which was uh, created in 1958 by brothers Giulio and Fiorenzo Frattini. Somehow they learned that Eastern Europeans were desperate to purchase a pair of jeans so initially they decided to make this jeans clothing and sell it in Poland, Czechoslovakia, Yugoslavia, Eastern Germany, Hungary and Bulgaria. And from there, rifle jeans showed up in the Soviet Union. So when people travel to those Eastern European countries, usually tourists or maybe for work, they saw inexpensive, nice looking rifle uh, jeans and they brought them back home for resale. Eventually, rifle brand jeans were imported officially into the Soviet Union. You could purchase them in the state stores. The retail price was 100 rubles, still a lot of money. If my mother, for example, was making 150 rubles a month, paying 100 rubles for a pair of jeans was a lot of money. And that's what uh, you people could do now. They could purchase the rifle jeans in a regular store, not just on the black market. Apparently, rifle jeans was one of the first companies that came up with the acid treatment of the jeans, which made them fade in faster, so they look good. And it also came with this brand, rifle brand uh, belt that was coming for free along with the jeans. Another popular sub brand was Montana Jeans. Uh, this brand was founded in Hamburg, Germany in the 60s by a Polish guy named Heisel and they had really heavy untreated denim that had a weight of 15 ounces so they were famous for being extremely hard you like literally can put them on the corner and they'll be standing. Montana jeans were never imported in Soviet Union legally mostly was smuggled by the sailors who of course were stopping in Hamburg quite often no doubt many lucky owners of Montana jeans thought they were made in the United States. They even had a map of Montana on its label, but no, it was made in Hamburg, Germany, and later production moved to Poland. And now let's talk about jeans that I was wearing on this picture. My jeans were called Riorda jeans and jeans. My mother bought me a pair of these jeans when I turned 16 for 100 rubles. Reorder the brand was, I thought it was imported from Italy. I always thought it was Italian brand. But just recently when I was researching this topic, I discovered that Reorder was actually manufactured or assembled in Soviet Union. The fabric was coming from India and hardware and the technology came from Italy, from this Riorda company. I would much rather prefer to have a rifle jeans because a friend of mine, Dima, had a pair and I really liked the way they looked, but the only jeans were available for sale the day my mom took me to the store was this Riorda. So we purchased them and I wore them forever. When finally Denise gave up, my mom uh, cut them short and stitched them, turned them into shorts. And I wore those for a long time and she used the back pockets to fix, you know, usually jeans you wear in the crotch part pretty quick. So she took the back pockets off to fix the crotch part. So yeah, those jeans, I put a lot of miles on them. But they weren't really Italian. But I want to remind you once again that the American jeans were the most desirable jeans in the Soviet Union. I heard even stories that people would borrow friends' jeans to go on a date to impress the girl because if she see a guy is wearing Levi's jeans that's like wow you know it's like he is driving Lamborghini I heard stories that uh, some kids of uh, Soviet diplomats that had Levi's jeans were approached by Gopniks and came home just in underwear because jeans were taken so yes Levi's was the most desirable, of course. 
Jeans. So anyone who traveled to the Soviet Union on a regular basis, for example, like foreign students that came to Moscow to attend colleges, some tourists or people who came on business, they knew that bringing Levi's jeans, for example, was the best way to cash out because for the rate of exchange, you will get 60 rubles for $100 US dollars. But if you bring in four pairs of Levi's jeans, and I guess back in the 70s, 80s, there was maybe like $25 a pair. Then you will sell each pair for 100 rubles or even 150 rubles to Fartsovshik. So now instead of getting 60 rubles for your $100, you're getting 400 rubles for your $100 investment. The main problem was to get through the Soviet customs. I also must mention fake goods since demand was so high and prices were so high. Some people were managing to... For example, move labels so they will have maybe rifle jeans, but they will steal a Levi's Strauss label and attach to it and try to sell it as Levi's. I actually met a guy who back in the 80s worked with Vietnamese students who brought fabric and hardware from Vietnam. Somehow they're also bringing like Levi's. Pretty much everything was made fake, of course, in Vietnam. And there was a school where they uh, taught people to how to make clothing. So they had a nice imported equipment to sew pants and stuff. So they were making manufacturing Levi's jeans in Kiev for resale. And he said they were making a killing. And of course, everything had changed since Soviet Union disappeared and socialism is no more. Suddenly we have a boutiques, Levi's boutiques, any brands of jeans in the world you could purchase in Ukraine. And I remember when I was traveling to the United States back in the mid-90s, people were asking me to bring a real pair of Levi's. And now it's like they don't care. They, they can buy all that or in Kiev or online. Well, my friends, it's all I have for you today. I hope you enjoyed this story and maybe learn something new. As always, please don't forget to like this video. Maybe share with your friends, and we'll talk to you soon. До свидания. Goodbye. Sergey uh, wrote a book based on diaries he made when he was first in the United States, and I, as I understand, this is just volume one, right? That's correct. He's going to have more, multiple volumes coming out. Well, I said, well, since uh, Sergey is kind enough to come up and speak with us, I bought the book. I said, I might as well read this. I read this in one sitting, two hours, two and a half hours. I just couldn't put it down. It was so fascinating because. Uh, your writing is very compelling for one, and his story is very interesting for two. It's really interesting. You know, we've lived here our whole lives. We don't have that perspective. It's just so interesting to hear someone else's perspective about what we take for granted. So I hope you really tune in and, and listen to what he has to say. It's a very interesting, very informed perspective. Sergey is not a historian. He's an electrical engineer by trade, but I find that he has a depth of understanding on history, economics, culture. So just a, just a very observant fellow and a, a great storyteller. So uh, let's.